We'd like to uh, get started. Um, uh, I'm wearing my Yale tie today. Why, you might ask. Uh, it's, uh, it's the resident match day. Um, at 1 o'clock, we'll share the, the good news about who our new complement of uh, entering psychiatry residents will be. Uh, there, I would like nothing more than to spill the beans, but since this is being videotaped, uh, everyone would know for all time that I, that I broke the silence, so I won't do that. Um, it's an incredible class, and we are very, very fortunate to have uh, such talented and motivated young people joining our faculty, and I want to thank everybody for helping with the recruitment process, and particularly congratulate David and, and, um, and Bob and, and Chris and uh, Bob and Vinod, et cetera, et cetera, Esperanza, the team, uh, and all the people that, that put in all the time for, uh, uh, for getting this class here to uh, Yale, particularly uh, people who donated their time for the interviews and um, the residents who above all uh, are uh, the best source of information to our applicants about what life in our department's like and, and uh, the most convincing salespeople. So thank, thank you everybody for all your hard work and congratulations because these people are, make the department a more fun place. Um, before I introduce John Murray to introduce our speaker today, um, let me just uh, uh, tell you a little bit about upcoming Grand Rounds lectures. Um, on the 23rd, that's next week, uh, Marsha Bates from Rutgers is going to be talking about uh, uh, novel ways of thinking about the treatment process for addiction. And uh, she's uh, got a title called Recovering from Addiction, Harnessing the Body to Support the Brain. Then the following uh, uh, Friday is Good Friday, and then after that is uh, um, the is uh, is Leslie Jameson, who is a, a, a renowned author, who's a, a novelist and an essayist, um, whose uh, uh, visit to Yale is funded through the Pointer Fellowship at Yale, um, and the title is the Recovering the Recovering colon intoxication and its aftermath, which is really an incredible, uh, related to an incredible book that, uh, that uh, Jameson has uh, written about the recovery process from addiction. I think that will be a very compelling, um, a very compelling Grand Rounds. Before I introduce uh, John, let, let me just say one word about our speaker today, who's uh, an old friend of mine. Um, you know, we've, we've been uh, trying to move from metaphor to mechanism in psychiatry. In other words, we have these stories that we tell about how behavior emerges and how the brain activity results in behavior. And these are metaphors. You know, for those of you who are philosophy buffs, this is a little bit, most of the things we say about the brain aren't really true. Like uh, antidepressants ameliorate serotonin deficit, or uh, dopamine, hy uh, dopamine hyperactivity uh, hypothesis of schizophrenia, or even uh, in its simplest, over simplistic form, the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia. These are s sh stories that we tell which are kind of shorthands that convey the idea that we know something about the brain but until we actually know the code, until we actually know how these mechanisms across levels and, and translate from gene to molecule, to neuron, to synaptic connection, to network, to behavior, until we really can know the codes and the, and the actual precise mechanisms, we're really quite limited in what we can do with all of this neuroscience stuff that we do in psychiatry. So today's lecture, we, we are extremely fortunate to have one of the world's great experts in computational neuroscience and psychiatry, uh, 
uh, talk to us about how we move across levels, how we use computational approaches to help us to get closer in, in moving from metaphor to mechanism. And, uh, and I'm going to introduce John to tell us more about it. John. Okay, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Klaus Stefan. As John mentioned, he's a real uh, leader, pioneer, visionary in this emerging field, which kind of falls under the umbrella that people are use calling computational psychiatry, right? Of using computational approaches and uh, leveraging advances in computational neuroscience to address problems in psychiatry, to understand, as John mentioned, the, the mechanisms of mental illness. Um, so let's see, so uh, Klaus has a, a joint chair at uh, ETH uh, Zurich and uh, University of Zurich where he uh, has founded the Translational Neuromodeling Unit um, in 2012. And that's, um, from what I know, a very uh, kind of special place where that combines the modelers and the clinical researchers in one environment um, to provide kind of complementary training and allow the people there to really focus um, on clinically important questions, which I think is the real kind of one of the main contributions that Klaus has given to this field. And um, on a personal level, it's been um, inspirational when I was entering this field from a physics, as a physics grad student, to be able to read his papers and think about, okay, what are the What's the right way to use these computational approaches to really address questions of important clinical uh, utility? And I think that's something that is present in uh, a lot of his work. Um, so Klaus says, you know, uh, part of the reason why he has such impact is because he's come at uh, this point from a very broad range of backgrounds. As an undergraduate, he studied medicine, computer science, mathematics. Um, he got his medical license and then a PhD in neuroinformatics. And has done various types of research, everything from neuroinformatics of neuroanatomy to um, modeling of neuroimaging as well as uh, cognitive function and behavior, application to psychiatry, so a really broad range of things, and I think that'll be represented in this talk today. Um, and so I hope you all are as inspired as I've been. Thank you. Well, thank you for the extremely kind words and the very warm welcome. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, there are many old friends here. It's fantastic to see you after some time, and it's wonderful to be at Yale for the very first time in my life. So thank you very much for your hospitality and for having me here. Now, I have uh, uh, put together a talk that um, I hope I can cover within the time I have. I will do my very best. I, I know there is time for question and, and a substantial amount of time, so uh, I will remain fairly superficial in some parts of my talk in the fond hope that we can talk about the details later on. Now, um, many of you will have seen papers that carry computational psychiatry in the title, and as Phil dryly commented earlier today, uh, we have more reviews in computational psychiatry than data papers. Um, <laughs> Um, and many of these papers actually come from Yale. Um, so uh, John and Xiao Jing wrote a very influential piece in Neuron. Phil, together with uh, Paul, wrote uh, um, a paper in psychiatry. So, so there's a lot, it, there are not many places in the world where computational psychiatry is as well represented as here at Yale. And indeed, the first book was published here. So this was uh, John and Ellen who put this together, uh, which is very impressive. So it is an equal honor for me to be here because, again, uh, Yale is one of the places where, where so many influences in computational psychiatry have been born and exert um, uh, their influence. Now, I um, want to start by just laying out taxonomy. So computational psychiatry is just one of several clinical disciplines, all of which draw on tools from computational neuroscience and the link between these two levels between this extremely broad theoretical field and the applied fields is translational neuromodeling which is a field that is interested in the modeling technologies that we need in order to make clinically useful statements it's a little bit like clinical chemistry provides the tools that then are applied in various clinical fields like internal medicine pediatrics etc and I will 
start with this and then later on talk about its application psychiatry and a little bit of those time about psychosomatics. Now, I understand the, the, most of you are psychiatrists, so I don't need to tell you very much about the nosology on which our diagnoses rest. So in classifications like DSM or ICD, diseases are defined as syndromatic entities. And while that has certain advantages in terms of reliability and mapping onto intuitive experience, there are some profound problems. The phenotyping is actually quite bad, but more importantly, under the same label, we are collecting <coughs> patients who respond radically differently to treatments quite frequently, and we have no way of predicting who will benefit from what approach. Now, the, so in other words, what our diseases are, they are spectrum diseases. And we've begun to understand in quite some detail in the past two or three decades, thanks to genetic studies and, and, and epidemiological studies, uh, the factors that lead to this diversity that we observe on the ward. And we have come to realize that <coughs> under these umbrella terms, schizophrenia, depression, etc., probably there are patients that are characterized by quite diverse disease mechanisms. Now, that is not a situation that the rest of medicine is unfamiliar with. In fact, there are very few diseases that are not spectrum diseases. You have to look hard. Uh, but the difference is, if you, for example, uh, um, look at disease in internal medicine, is that over the literally two or three centuries, past uh, two or three centuries, the, f the field has developed tests essays, for example, that allow you to infer from an observed symptom to the underlying mechanisms, uh, onto the underlying mechanism and causes. So, for example, if you encounter a patient with jaundice, you know that three different organ systems at least could be affected, all of which lead to the accumulation of the same molecule. You can use tests to infer which of these systems are affected, and then even within a system, say in the liver, you can, thanks to assays, disambiguate different causes of why a particular mechanism has gone awry. So in translational neuromodeling, we adopt a similar philosophy and hope that we can do something useful in a similar manner, in that we would like to construct essays, but because the brain is much more difficult to assess, we, they have to be of a computational sort that infer from observed brain activity and behavior onto underlying mechanisms that generate, for example, symptoms, but also uh, uh, brain activity. So the idea is that if we can build models that embody putative mechanisms of disease, and we can apply them to data that we can acquire in a clinical setting, then hopefully we can disambiguate different mechanisms and group the, or dissect these spectra into more homogeneous subgroups. And the hard bit then is to show in prospective studies that the assignment of individual patients to a suspected mechanism enables a successful treatment prediction. Up to here, this is all mathematics, this is all beautiful fantasy, this is easy. The hard bit is this, and that can only be done in prospective studies, a theme that I will return to uh, multiple times. Now, when we talk about computational models, then we could be doing all sorts of things. But because as clinicians and practitioners, we need to make a statement about the individual subject, we must engage, we, we must talk about inference. Um, we have to infer from measured data onto hidden mechanisms. And the general statistical framework to do that is Bayesian statistics or Bayesian inference. And this is just a a, a very general um, approach in probability, uh, based on probability theory that allows you to combine information um, about a quantity that you do not know, say a parameter of a distribution or a parameter of a system that, that you're trying to understand. So this information is called the prior. This can be something that you know a priori or that you believe a priori. You you, and, and Bayes' theorem des uh, describes how you combine such information with data, the so-called likelihood, in order to arrive at an optimal estimate of that hidden quantity, of that parameter. That's the posterior. Now, there is a different way of looking at this, which is actually more intuitive, because it, it, it is very directly related to the problem we're facing. So Bayes' theorem can also be understood as a forward mapping, as a forward mapping from 
the hidden state of a system that you would like to know but you cannot observe to something you can measure. So for example, you might be interested in knowing the synaptic strength of certain circuits that you believe are relevant for a psychiatric disease. You could now in principle formulate a probabilistic model that says or that predicts what sort of data, measurable data, resulted if the, state, if the circuit was in a particular state, that is, certain parameters theta were present, certain connection strength, for example. That is nothing but the likelihood. If you combine that with some prior information, you have a complete probabilistic forward model from the hidden state of a system to data. Because you now have that complete link, you can in principle turn it around and do what we call model inversion. You're going from the data to the hidden state of the system. And that is nothing but applying Bayes' theorem and computing the posterior. Now, this approach is called generative modeling. That's a term from statistics and machine learning. Technically, that means it's just a model that, uh, that describes the full joint probability of data and parameters. More intuitively, you can see it as a model that tells you how the data are generated. You can literally use this as a simulation device. Now, this sort of approach can also be applied to behavior, where now the job is to infer from given, uh, from measured behavior onto the underlying algorithm or information processing principle that an individual deploys during a particular task. And we will see examples of both during this talk. So if we think back of the John Dice example I showed and the general tendency in medicine that we have seen to move uh, from symptoms to mechanisms and causes, then I would argue the challenge for us, if we want to be serious about applications, is to make that first step and bring us from the symptom level to the mechanism or pathophysiological level. And the three different challenges that we need to address, and over the next few slides I will show you in a nutshell the philosophy of how we believe it can be addressed. The three key problems we need to solve are differential diagnosis, stratification and prediction. If we can crack those problems, then we've made a real step forward in how psychiatry can make use of models. So let me show you in all brevity and very superficially how these three different problems can in principle be addressed using generative models. So differential diagnosis I mean, that's the thing that doctors do on wards every day. A patient comes in, he or she has certain symptoms that bother him or her, and then in the head of the physician, a variety of hypotheses pop up, and informally, there is no mathematics there. It's, it's intuition and experience and informal thinking. You are evaluating in your head how likely it is that this symptom could have been caused by this problem or by that problem. Now. If you have a generative model, you can do that formally. So what the generative model gives you is not just an estimate of the hidden parameters, but it also gives you something called the model evidence. That, that's a measure of how likely the data that you have observed could have been generated by the model, which embodies a disease process. So what we would like to have, we don't have it yet, but what we would like to have, what we're working towards to, is that for a given lead symptom, say hallucinations, delusions, depressed mood, whatever. For a given symptom, we would like to have a set of models, each of which embodies a particular hypothesis about how that symptom comes about, fit the models to the data, obtain the model evidence, compute the posterior probability of the model, and then have a formal statement, a formal probability statement about which possible mechanism is most likely in this patient. Now, the other thing is prediction. We need to be able to predict for a given patient how she or he or she will develop, what sort of treatment is mostly, uh, most likely to be beneficial. And here generative models again give you a real advantage. If you are a standard machine learning person, you would say, well, that's not a problem. You just give me data and I will construct some classifier or some regression model. I will find some mapping. The problem you're facing is that typically you are drowning in complexity. The data that you've been given is so high dimensional that it can be very difficult to find any um, good mapping. And the other problem is that any such classifier is unlikely to be interpretable. It's just a black box. Now what the generative model does is you give it the data 
uh, you fit the model and you obtain parameter estimates. Now these are all in terms of the number of then data points, namely parameter estimates, that's orders of magnitudes less than the data. And you can now start to classify, for example, in the space of parameter estimates as opposed to the data. And let me just show you one very simple example. This is a study that we did quite a few years ago already, which um, I think uh, was the initial demonstration that this is useful. And these are data from stroke patients, so not really psychiatry. These are patients who had a stroke in the frontal cortex and were aphasic. We took data from the healthy part of the brain, from the auditory system that was not affected by the stroke, and we asked the simple question, if we construct a model of this early auditory system, medial geniculate body, Haschel's gyrus, planum temporale, and we estimate the synaptic connection strength based on fMRI, so these are glutamatergic long-range connections that we're trying to estimate, can we detect whether or not someone has a remote lesion, a hidden non-observed lesion because we're looking at the healthy part of the brain. And if you try to do that on the raw data, you can't do it. If you try to use, uh, if you do it on parameter S from general model, you can do it, but not great. If you use correlation, uh, functional connectivity, you also can do it, but again, not great. If you use this model, which is a, a dynamic causal model, which we'll come to later, you're near perfect. And these are out of sample predictions. So in other words, what the model has done for you it has distilled a very high dimensional data set into, in this case, round about 15 numbers. And now you operate in that space of 15 numbers as opposed to thousands of data points. And this is a denoised summary of the mechanism that created the data. That's the power that you can utilize here. And you can also apply it now to address the last question, I mean, stratification. Now, in other words, we're now going unsupervised. We're trying to detect subgroups that we don't know yet. And so we, we proceed in the same manner. We invert the model. We obtain the posterior densities. But now we use, for example, clustering. And here's an example from a study done with colleagues at Berlin, Florian Schlagenhauf and um, Lorenz Di Zerno. So these are 41 schizophrenic patients who, we, uh, who, was, who were studied with a very simple visual working memory paradigm. Very simple model, just three regions, visual cortex, parietal cortex, prefrontal cortex, our colleagues in Berlin did the modeling, they fitted the model. They gave us just the parameter estimates. So, in other words, as opposed to sending gigabytes and gigabytes of imaging data, we just got a tiny little file with 10 numbers per subject. And we just worked with those 10 numbers. Applying a variation Gauss mixture model, we found that there are three subgroups in this cohort. This is what they look like on average, where the width of the arrows illustrate average connection strength. And you can see that the prefrontal connections particularly vary in these three subgroups as a function of working memory load. But critically, this purely physiological characterization now maps onto symptoms. So the PANS negative symptom score co uh, is clearly distinct between these three physiologically defined subgroups. Now this is not useful yet. We haven't solved a problem. We have, we, this is something the clinician knows anyway. We, we have not been useful, but what we have shown, and, and I'm not sure I can show you, well, no, I can show you one thing where we, we're starting to become useful. Um, no, I, I emphasize this because we, as modelers, we, we quickly fall in love with our results. And there is a whole generation of machine learners in neuroimaging who, are very, who, who were entertaining themselves proudly for a decade trying to construct classifiers that distinguish psychotic patients from controls. And that's not solving a problem. Yeah? It's just not, you're not going to waste $5,000 on a scan to make the diagnosis of psychosis. Um, and that's why I'm stressing this. This is not useful, but it illustrates the potential. Namely, if we can now bring this into a perspective setting and turn this into prediction about treatment, for example, then it is useful. So this was just a very brief overview of the philosophy, why generative models are so useful, as opposed to, say, brute force machine learning. However, a generative model always rests on an idea. And if you do not have a good clinical theory, you are lost. So good clinical theories and intuition are and experience are absolutely important to guide the modeling work. And I emphasize that again.
it means that the interplay, the communication between clinicians and modelers is absolutely crucial. It's not going to work if you separate the two groups. So I want to familiarize you very briefly with a, with a theory that I assume many of you know anyway, but then I want to link it to a specific theory um, of schizophrenia. And the general theory that um, guides many of um, the current thoughts in the field about psychiatry is called the Bayesian brain hypothesis. And it's, it is basically saying that the brain itself is a generative model. Put differently, the brain is just a scientist who is confronted with noisy, ambiguous data and is trying to make sense of what has been causing those sensory inputs. So the brain is facing exactly the same problem that we face when we observe brains. And so in other words, the, the idea is that the brain constructs a generative model that explains how states of the world, including the body, lead to this noisy sensations that it receives and then inverts its model in order to estimate those states. Now, this is, this is a, a really profound idea which has been around for a long time, goes back, even though not in probabilistic terms, to the work of Helmholtz in the late 19th century. It really took off when people started to realize in the 90s that there are some intriguing parallels between the anatomical structure of the brain all of you, I presume, know this famous Feldman Essen diagram of the hierarchical arrangement of areas based on the connectivity, and the structure of what's called hierarchical Bayesian models. So in hierarchical Bayesian models, each level of an information processing system, in this case the brain, makes predictions about the level below and tries to infer its state. So in other words, each level receives a prediction from the level below about its state, compares it to its state, computes a prediction error and sends it back up to the next to the higher level in order to help it correct its predictions. And you can show that this is a way to implement Bayes' theorem in a manner that's neuronally plausible. People like, so this is from the famous round Ballard paper, 99, Nature Neuroscience, and then a number of people in particular, Carl Friston, worked on it uh, to endow it with biological realism and pointed out, for example, and something that we will return to later on, that the anatomy puts quite strong constraints on what type of neuronal units are likely to implement this and where they are located. Namely, for example, that in the upper layers of cortex, you would expect to see prediction error units. And we will see that, well, as an image uh, soon. And in the lower layers, prediction units. Now, this, what I told you about, is the fundament to a theory that, that I contributed to and um, that um, has guided much of my own work in, in schizophrenia, including some ongoing prospective treatment prediction studies. And this is the uh, so-called disconnection hypothesis of schizophrenia. This goes back to uh, work by Carl Friston in the late 90s, and when I was a postdoc with him at London, I... I um, took it and uh, together with Kant de developed it further in order to incorporate those hierarchical Bayesian ideas but also to make this explicit statement about heterogeneity to explain how heterogeneity in schizophrenia can be understood. And the claim here is that what we call schizophrenia is a spectrum of disturbances in, physiologically speaking, interactions between the NMDA receptor and neuromodulators or equivalently computationally speaking, hierarchical Bayesian inference. And I will try to unpack that a little bit over the next few slides. However, for me, the, the key thing that is guiding my work at the moment is this predicts that if we could measure, or rather infer, NNI in individual patients and define subgroups of patients, we should be able to predict treatment response, something I may or may not talk about later on. So you might wonder for a second, and it's, it's, it's a good question, what exactly do we mean by NNI? Well, what I mean by it is literally the postsynaptic interaction between the intracellular cascades elicited by NMDA receptor activation with the calcium influx that it mediates, the activation of kinases and phosphatases, and the short-term and long-term synaptic modifications, and cascades that are elicited by the activation of metatrophic receptors such as dopaminergic receptors so that they interact and 
the concurrent activation of these dopaminergic, cholinergic, etc. receptors modifies the intracellular processes and the synaptic modifications that depend on NMDA receptor activation. Critically, some of these are quite fast. Some of these literally can unfold on a millisecond scale, such as the phosphorylation of NMDARs uh, following dopamine receptor activation. And that's important because we are experimentalists who cannot wait for hours until LTP has taken place. We need to see changes over the course of a measurement. Now, this is a, a not an this is a target that's not entire, that is not entirely unattractive for explaining the known risk factors for schizophrenia because it is a meeting point for both environmental influences known to increase risk for schizophrenia, such as certain drugs, such as the presence of certain cytokines, such as certain endocrinological factors or metabolic factors, but also genetic influences. So some, and this is a very short and highly selected list, of course, from the genes that are identified as the most uh, relevant risk genes. So they meet at this intersection. They both influence either the NMDA receptor or neuromodulators or their interaction. Now, switching to computation, uh, uh, the, the, what I've been talking about so far was purely physiology. But in terms of computation, we can now write down models that incorporate hierarchical Bayesian inference. And what I think the contribution of uh, our paper in 2006 in biological psychiatry was that we made that very specific claim that this key computational deficit in schizophrenia that causes the symptoms that we observe is abnormal belief updating, hierarchical belief updating, that is based on precision-weighted prediction errors. And that precision is a very critical aspect that I will come to in a second. And physiologically, again, this maps onto abnormal modulation of NMDA receptor-dependent plasticity in cortical hierarchies. Now, that idea has been used in, in many different ways, and there are there are many distinguished colleagues, including, for example, Phil here, who has, who has written very elegantly about these ideas and tested many of them experimentally. In fact, uh, in, a, in a minute or so, we will see some of your work. Um, but I want first, actually, one slide down the line, yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to briefly unpack this a little bit more, this, this idea of precision-weighted prediction errors. So when you look at the computations in Bayesian hierarchies, there is a very simple form that emerges. And this is very generic. It holds for any, under many assumptions about the type of probability distributions that might be represented in those hierarchies. What you tend to see in any of those models, whether it's predictive coding, whether it's hierarchical filtering, even for non-hierarchical, just Bayesian belief updating, you will see that changes in beliefs, that is the probability distributions represented at different cortical levels, are proportional to prediction error, but weighted by a precision ratio. And this precision ratio is the precision of the input versus the precision of the prediction. And that makes great sense, because if you receive an input that has very high signal-to-noise ratio, then any prediction error caused by that input has more credibility, because the data are very strong. But if, on the other hand, you have very strong prior beliefs to start with, you need a lot of evidence to be convinced to start changing your beliefs. So these two precisions work in opposite directions. And, the, uh, and that's really quite central to understand uh, uh, psychotic symptoms. So very simply speaking, the ideas um, that started to become articulated at the time of that paper were when, p when prediction errors are too precise, then everything that you sense is imbued with salience. Everything is meaningful. The world becomes a chaotic place. And when you think about it, that's very reminiscent of what many patients tell you in the prodromal phase. You know, just everything is important. They're desperately trying to create sense of a world that is just hyper-salient. And you can show mathematically that under one central assumption, which is very principled, and I'll come back to it later, namely that in those hierarchies, the goal is 
to explain away prediction error and result in a stable inference with minimal surprise about the data, under that assumption, necessarily, higher levels of the hierarchy will have to become, will have to adjust and become very precise in order to explain away those precise prediction errors. Again, look at that ratio. If that bit becomes too big, you have to put something against it that restores the ratio. And that may be a mechanism for causing delusions. And again, something that Phil and John have written about very eloquently. On the other hand, when predictions become too precise, then that is a, a, a nice metaphor to understand, not, well, more than a metaphor, uh, as we will see in a second, to understand hallucinations. And indeed, um, Al and Phil and one of my previous uh, students, Chris Mattis, uh, produced this extremely elegant uh, work. I, was, I, I, I continue to be so impressed, and it's a wonderful piece of work, where they showed, I believe, for the first time, truly convincingly, that this idea holds. Um, I won't go through all the details because, well, first of all, I'm sure you know it. Secondly, Phil and Al can explain it so much better than I could. But in a nutshell, they used a very clever sensory conditioning paradigm across a range of or peri-threshold intensities to induce beliefs about the concurrent presentation of auditory and visual stimuli, and then cleverly presented in the test phase only the visual stimuli and asked how often they experienced the auditory percept, and then used a model that we will see later on, the hierarchical Gaussian filter, which was developed in my group now seven years ago, to show that hallucinations occurred due to the overweighting to overly high precision of prior beliefs. So I want to summarize this section and move on, but I, I do want to summarize, and because it's important for what follows, what um, what one, I think, can argue um, with some justification when one reviews the literature over the past two decades is that this dual perspective in cortical hierarchies of hierarchical base and um, neuromodulation of NMDA uh, receptor dependent plasticity, there are links emerging between the different components of the Bayesian recipe, if you will, namely change in belief being proportional to precision times prediction error, and the components of NNI. So you, the evidence points to prediction errors, and I'm specifically talking about the cortex here, just to prevent any misunderstanding. This is just cortex. So prediction errors, we think, are being conveyed via ionotropic glutamatergic receptors, in particular AMPA, but also NMDA. Predictions probably exclusively via NMDA receptors and precisions via neuromodulation and possibly local inhibition. The key thing is, if one thinks that this theory is not entirely implausible, and I tend to think that, then your job as a modeler gets very clear. Your job as a modeler, if you think this is not entirely implausible, is to develop models that can infer upon these computational quantities and these physiological quantities. That's what we need to do. If we've got tools to do this, we can go and test in a population of schizophrenic patients whether we achieve meaningful stratification and meaningful predictions. And that's the rest of what I will talk about uh, in the remainder of my talk. With a little excursion to pathological gambling if you will forgive me. Um, so this is the game plan of, of my research program. Um, and in fact, I should put in theories, because the first step, as we just discussed, is always the theory building. You know? without, a good, without a theory, you're lost. Now, based on a theory, we can start to construct the physiological and computational or information processing models that hopefully will give us some estimate of these quantities. And then we will have to show in prospective studies that they are not entirely useless in making predictions about individual patients. And I'm stressing this individual here. I mean, it's clear to you, you are clinicians, many of you are clinicians, uh, but it's not so clear for the engineer, yeah? that, that you have to make a statement about the individual. It's not an average prediction. So let's have a brief look at physiological models and then 
uh, after that computational models, and then we will talk about this. Um, I must confess I'm completely lost in time. Ah, oh, there, there we are. Okay, good. Isn't it embarrassing? I live in Switzerland and don't, don't have a watch. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure they will let me back into the country. Uh, okay, good. Um, so, physiology. The, the, gener the generative modeling framework that, that I tend to use and that I've been... Um, that I've had the opportunity to contribute to is called dynamic causal modeling. It's a slightly fancy name, slightly, a bit too fancy for my taste, for something that is essentially rather simple. Name, it's, it basically, it's nothing but Bayesian state space model estimation, something that engineers are doing in all sorts of domains. Um, the idea is very simple. Um, again, as we discussed before, we are constructing a model of, neuronal, of a neuronal circuit where we describe activity of neuron populations by differential equations. We then have a, a model of how those neuronal uh, states are being transformed into measurable data. These two components give us a probabilistic forward model, which under appropriately chosen priors, some of which can be obtained from anatomical imaging, serve for model inversion and allow us to estimate the parameters. So if we take a brief look at DCM for fMRI, and I was told that you like equations, so I didn't take them out, but they're not important. Um, it's just the graphical structure that's important here. What this model allows us to do is to start with experimental inputs that you know because you've defined the experiment to a model that you define of a circuit based on your understanding of the anatomy. And you can then model using these differential equations, dynamics in these, between these regions, uh, and how they are changed by experimental conditions. And the neuronal states are then being passed through a hemodynamic model that eventually gives you a predicted bold signal. So this is a probabilistic forward model, and now we, we can invert it and try to estimate the strength of connections. It's not a fMRI, I mean, has limits, so, so we can't be overly detailed in our representation, but it's good enough for us to infer directed connection strength, which we anatomically in the cortex again know are almost universally, with a few exceptions, in, uh, glutamatergic. Now, I want to just flash up a few developments we've had in the past few years because they speak directly to this ongoing effort over a decade now to develop tools that test things like the disconnection hypothesis. And I want to focus on two things. Layered DCMs and whole brain DCMs. So, I mentioned to you earlier these constraints that anatomy puts on hierarchical Bayesian models, namely that one would predict or assume that prediction error units are in upper layers and prediction units are in lower layers. And if you now want to find evidence for specific abnormalities in patients, we need to be able to image individual lamina. Now, that's a physics problem. But there is something else. The vasculature of the cortex induces a very problematic confound because arterials move into the cortex in a way that is perpendicular to the surface. They spread into capillary beds and then the venous blood flow is again perpendicular now back to the surface. The problem is neural activity here in the lower layers leads to vascular changes to change in blood flow that will also be seen up here. So we have a systematic blood drainage confound that we need to deal with. And what we did uh, a year ago, uh, we developed a first model for how you can disambiguate neuronal and vascular components and get proper estimates of activity in upper layers. And this model is important when you now have the opportunity to image individual cortical lamina. This is work that I really must credit to my colleague Klaus Krusmann. He's an MRI physicist and an excellent one, who developed a new technique that we've been exploiting here called magnetic field sensing. This is basically a set of sensors around your head that measure the magnetic field and that tell you, or rather the scanner, how imperfect the gradients have been executed because sequences never do quite what you think they do. They're always engineering constraints. So you can use these measures to correct your gradients. 
and get extremely nice images, undistorted, artifact-free. You can correct for movement online. And this is what you see here. This is a, an image obtained at 0.3 millimeter isotropic resolution. It's not as nice as it is on my laptop because the resolution is not quite as good, but it, it looks like mic microscopy when you look at it. Now, we've done now a study with 40 healthy volunteers using the mismatch negativity, and this is one subject. We've only analyzed one because, as always, there's no free lunch. The data that we acquire here is so gigantic, we have terabytes of data per subject, that it takes a whole week just to reconstruct the raw data. But what we get are submillimeter isotropic resolution with spiral acquisition, undistorted fMRI images, beautiful quality. We can separate the different cortical lamina. These are, this, these are, um, uh, this is the, the mean EPI, uh, not EPI, spiral uh, T2 star image uh, in one subject. This is a single T2 star weighted image. And you can see how nice the contrast is between white and gray matter. And again, Believe me, it looks so much nicer on my laptop. Come and see me and I will, I, I will proudly show you the images. But anyway, so we can now get measures from individual lamina, at least upper and lower. This is the prediction error measure here. Upper layers, significantly higher prediction error responses than predictions, as one would expect. But again, remember, it's one subject. Yeah. So we will, in one year, we will have pre-processed the remaining 40 people and then I will know more. But anyway, I just wanted to point this out because this is going to be, I think, laminar fMRI with high res, uh, that's going to be a real, a potential real game changer. Now, the other thing is, one of the problems with DCM is it's restricted to small circuits. Now, we've uh, made some, uh, n n um, yeah, I would say significant process in going whole brain. And this is something we call regression DCM. And the idea here is that we are turning the inversion of a generative model that is based on differential equations which is very slow because you have to integrate all of the equations every time you evaluate the likelihood function, we turn this into a Bayesian linear regression problem, which is extremely fast. And this is done in the frequency domain. So in other words, we're turning a linear DCM in the time domain into a Bayesian GLM in the frequency domain. What this allows us to do, this is something we, we published last year. We showed that you can now take circuits of a size an order of magnitude larger than what you normally do in DCM. So this is a simulation with 66 areas using the, the Hagman data set from this famous 2008 PLOSPology paper with the uh, whole brain connectome. This has 300 connectivity parameters. That is a non-trivial number. We can compute this in three seconds on a standard laptop. So this is fast. And we have more recently now moved on to sparse versions because the problem that you have with whole brain models generally is that first of all you get this huge connectivity matrix in most cases you're lost in results and more importantly often you do not have enough data to estimate all of those parameters sufficiently well because you need a certain number of data points per parameter to have an accurate estimate so the solution is to automatically prune the network as part of model inversion I won't go through the math here, but I'll just show you results from a paper that's currently under, re under revision. So this is from, a, from the workhouse of functional neuroimaging, finger tapping. Yeah. Still, still going strong after all those years. Um, so th we chose this because, well, we have a good idea of what uh, connections are relevant. Um, so uh, so we, take, we, we take a single subject, we apply a parcellation of choice. That, that is not a very good choice, you could, but you can use anything you like. It's just easily available, the AAL. This has 104 regions, which means you're dealing with, it, with more than 10,000 connections. And we estimate them in such a way that we optimally prune the network and find an optimally sparse solution. This <coughs> amounts to 9% of the connection in this case. This is the connectogram. It finds all the connections that you would expect, for example, between motor cortices and cerebellum. And importantly, this is really fast. We can do it under one minute on, a standard, on standard hardware. So I, I'm mentioning this because just to give you a frame of reference, the work that gets closest to this that I know of uses 36 regions and uses 24 hours on a high-performance cluster. So we've now gone 
several orders of magnitude gone up in performance. And that makes it practical such that hopefully in the next few years we can put a box onto the radiologist's desk and let him or her compute whole brain connectograms as he or she examines the patient. Okay, enough fMRI. Uh, moving on to electrophysiology, um, which is interesting because it's much cheaper, much more easily available, much less stressful for the patient. Those of you who, who have worked with, for example, psychotic patients, it's not easy to convince them to go into the scanner. EEG, much easier. So the beauty of EEG is also that if you know where to look, if you know the sources, the data is so much richer. And you have the luxury now to fit far more fine-grained and interpretable models, such as conductance-based models that describe flow of ions across the postsynaptic membrane as a sum of ion, oh, sorry, of channel-specific uh, potential differences. And I want to give you just one example that is very recent work. Uh, and I'm not the lead, uh, I'm not the person who led this. This is really the hard work by Rosalind Moran and Mikhail Simmons at London and mm -hmm. Oxford, who collected 29 patients with NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis over a mere seven years or so. So hard work. This is something that I believe most of you will be familiar with. Um, First of all, because it is something that does feature now in discussions about psychosis, because the formation of these antibodies often leads to dramatic psychotic symptoms, but also because there was a book and a film that some of you may have seen. This is a journalist who I believe used to work at the... She New visited. She visited. Well, then you know so much more about this than I do. So she wrote a book about her experience of suffering from, from this condition. So we use this disease now as a model as a model given to us by nature where a specific ion channel is affected. And what uh, we did was we, we built a, a little um, conductance-based model consisting of different types of neurons. So if you will, a highly abstract cortical column. And we uh, constructed a network model consisting of prefrontal and parietal sources um, based on work from the Oxford group who showed that these are the sources that explain most of the EEG activity measured during what is often called, and it's a terrible name, the resting state. Um, so unconstrained cognition, in other words. And what we find when we invert the models, so the red dots are the patients with NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis, and the gray dots are controls, and these are patients who also suffer from encephalitis, but of a different cause and also healthy controls. So there were, I believe, 19 patients with other types of insulators and 19 healthy controls. So if you now plot the parameter estimates against each other, you can visually already see that there is some degree of separation. It's not perfect, but you can start to pull these groups apart. Now, these NMDA receptor antibody insulators patients include those with chronic and acute stages. If you restrict it to the acute stage, you can separate them perfectly. There is a, you, can, you can put a linear hyperplane through that space and separate those patients with some qualifications that I won't go into, go into now for, for lack of time. Also, you can look at the parameter estimates that make this possible, and it is indeed specifically the NMDA receptor estimates that make this distinction possible. So this is a demonstration that, in principle, you can go from surface EEG measurements to statements about changes at a cellular level that are clearly important. Even for this disease, I mean, remember, this is a clinical diagnosis. The presence of these antibodies does not allow you to make this, the diagnosis of NMDA receptor encephalitis because quite a few people without symptoms have these antibodies. Yeah. Right, enough physiology, computation. We talked about this idea earlier that, that, uh, that the brain em embodies a hierarchical generative model and uses uh, and inverts it in order to do perception. The problem is 
the models that happen around, and they're beautiful models like predictive coding, you can't just throw them at data. They're not models you can fit. So one of, and that's a problem for us as translational neural modelers. So what one of my students, Christoph Mattes, did in his PhD, and Christoph, I should say, is really a remarkable individual because he's both a physicist, trained at ETH, and a psychologist, so he has that dual perspective. During his PhD, he took on the challenge to transform those ideas into a model that would be very generic and applicable and very efficiently so. And so what he came up with, and this is, I should also mention, really based on previous work by Tim Behrens and Matthew Rushworth, um, um, Mark Woolrich, my apologies, perhaps also Matthew, why not, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> uh, um, so there is this uh, 2007 Nature Neuroscience paper um, th th that presented a similar model, but again one that you couldn't fit. And what Christoph now suggested under some clever and generic approximations was that you can describe how sensory stimuli that the brain receives are caused by events in the world that themselves are caused by probabilistic associations between states of the world that undergo changes. In other words, the world is volatile. And that the brain inverts a gen this generative model and infers upon these different states. And critically, because we know that these equations aren't most likely not solvable, uses an approximation that is subject specific. So in other words, you can now start to understand and, and quantify aberrations of individual Bayesian inference. Again, the same recipe emerges in this model that we talked about before. Um, and what you can now do with this model is you can fit it to behavioral data, or indeed, if, if you so wish, single trial electrophysiological data, and you can construct or infer computational trajectories of different prediction errors about the occurrence of stimuli, about probabilities, about volatility, and use that in analyses of, for example, neuroimaging data. And I want to show you two examples that um, shed new light, I hope, or, or some, some light at least, uh, on a very old paradigm that is of central interest for schizophrenia research, which is the good old mismatch negativity that I presume many of you are familiar with. In brief, it's a very simple paradigm where you present sensory stimuli, typically auditory ones, at least traditionally, and these streams of stimuli are occasionally interrupted by surprising oddballs. And you can then measure a very canonical response, and this is inverted, minus is up here, plus is here. This is a very canonical response that you can observe in, relation, uh, in response to this, this surprising stimulus. This is the mismatch negativity, and it scales with the unpredictability of the oddball. Critically, it's one of the most robust electrophysiological markers we have in schizophrenia at the group level. It hasn't really been transformed into a subject-specific tool, but at the group level, it's incredibly robust. There is this meta-analysis by Umbricht and, I can't pronounce the name, Krelius, I guess, um, who showed that uh, in all of the studies ever done, and these are at the, this was 2008, and there was 35 studies or so, only one failed to find a significant difference. So it's an extremely robust marker. Classically, we have interpreted this as a pre-attentive change detection, but now in the light of those Bayesian theories, we tend to understand it or interpret it as reflection of hierarchical Bayesian inference. But that's been a theory for many years, and you need to show this. We did show this in a paper in 2013, but I won't go into this because it's, it's a bit technical and a bit... Um, and the graphics is a bit unexciting. Um, so I'll show you s something that's slightly more pleasing to the eye and, and also more recent. Um, so I'm not getting bored with my own old work. Um, but to, to make that uh, uh, accessible, uh, I need to first prepare you for the images that, are now, that will now be shown. Because this is not the sort of visualization that those of you who work with EEG is standard. So. What we do, what we will see in the next few slides, is a way where we do single trial EEG analysis. 
and we treat the EEG data now the same way that we treat fMRI data. That is, we collect EEG scalp potential landscapes measured at different time bins within a trial into 3D images and then subject those images to a general linear model where we now have trial by trial predictions from a computational model in exactly the same manner as we would subject images from fMRI to a GLM. And what we end up with then is this plot here where here you see within trial time here you see electrodes across the uh, uh, um, hang on x-axis and here uh, along the y-axis. And in order to, to test this idea more formally that MMN can really be understood as um, um, hierarchical Bayesian inference and also test the idea that it's sensitive to NMDA receptor function, we used first of all this paradigm that has stable and volatile phases of when the surprising turns occur and we use ketamine versus placebo and this is a collaboration with uh, Franz Vollenweider at uh, Zurich. We also did a, a much larger study with dopaminergic and cholinergic drugs, but we haven't been unblinded yet, so it's not so interesting to talk about. But that'll be very interesting to see to what degree dopamine and acetylcholine will also exert differential effects. What Lillian Weber, a PhD student in my group, then did was she constructed a standard three-level HGF. We can now make predictions how an ideal Bayesian observer who is being exposed to that stimulus sequence, what type of prediction errors about the stimulus occurrences but also about the probabilities of the stimulus will experience. We can do trial by trial analyses and what we find is that, and this is now the average effect across placebo and ketamine, and this is a within subject design I should say, we find that there is an early response at central electrodes um, <coughs> at a time window that is reminiscent of the classical MMN. This is a prediction error response but stimulus occurrence is a low level prediction error. And then later on we see a prediction error about the probability of the stimulus, so a more abstract high level prediction error from the hierarchy. So you see that temporal sequence and we find that the ketamine effect is expressed exactly at this high-level prediction error. That is, this high-level prediction error is diminished under ketamine versus placebo. So in other words, ketamine has disabled, has reduced the brain's ability to update expectations about how likely a stimulus will be. So that is a nice, a nice link to the idea that Hierarchical Bayesian inference that infers the social structure of the world does depend on regular NMDA receptor function and becomes impaired if the NMDA receptor function is, in this case, antagonized. Won't talk about this because, as I mentioned, we're not unblinded yet. The second brief example is, uh, this is again very recent work, just, uh, came, just was just accepted a few days ago. This is now visual MMN because you find the same type of response in other sensory modalities. And here we used a factorial design where we, where we change both color and emotion in displays that are being flashed up. And we again used the HGF to compute prediction errors. In this case this is a simpler model because there was no volatility. So this is just a prediction error about the nature of the stimulus that's occurring. Again we do single trial EEG. And we find this is for color and this is for emotion. Prediction error responses at equivalent time windows and electrodes early during the standard <coughs> MMN window and then a later response, uh, considerably later at around 400 something milliseconds. So this, what this says is that there is evidence in single trial responses that the brain activity contains a representation of these prediction errors, of these precision weight prediction errors. However, one might now rightfully ask, well that's fair enough, but aren't there simpler explanations? So what about, for example, the classical interpretation? Just change detection. 
So we also implemented a change detection model and we then ran a Bayesian model comparison across all voxels in our sensor time data matrix. This is the blue histogram here and also in a functionally constrained mask where both models lead to significant activity. And in either case, what you see plotted here is the difference in the BIC values as an approximation to the model evidence difference. And a positive value means the Bayesian model wins, and a negative model means the change detection model wins. And a value of 5 would already be strong enough that you would be very certain about this model being better. And you can see that the very large majority of voxels whether across the entire volume or constrained by function is better explained by the Bayesian model and not by change detection. Which means you really need to account for uncertainty in your belief updating in order to explain those data. Right, now we come to the bit that's most exciting and where I have least to show. <laughs> Predictions about individual <coughs> patients. Um, as I mentioned before, all of any, any, any work that aspires to be clinically useful has to pass through prospective studies that are tailored to clinically important questions and where we can test whether the model would have predicted the outcome and would have facilitated the clinician's decision making. So at Zurich we are lucky to have a unit that is, t is designed to support such studies. At the moment, we are running five studies on schizophrenia, depression, autism, pathological gambling, and MS. And all of these studies try to tackle a concrete problem. Predicting treatment response, for example, in schizophrenia, we try to predict if, uh, whether someone will benefit from switching to olanzapine or clozapine. Depression, we try to predict whether... Um, um, you can safely withdraw from antidepressants when you're feeling well. Autism, we try to establish a, a diagnostic test for adult autism. Pathological gambling, we try to predict treatment response to psychotherapy, etc. I want to show you one study. This is very recent. Uh, these are very recent results. Um, this is not a study we did at Zurich, but a study we did in close collaboration with Brisbane, with uh, um, Phil Mosley and Michael Breakspear. They had uh, the wonderful opportunity, because Phil is a clinician specialized in that domain, to follow up patients who have undergone DBS in the substomic nucleus because of Parkinson's disease. And as you will know, impulse control disorders are not infrequently observed after DBS and do present a major clinical problem when they occur. We cannot presently predict whether a patient undergoing this procedure will have impulse control problems. Um, so what we're trying to do here is to predict them prior to surgery from a model. And the simple idea that, we won't, that I won't have time to explain in detail now is that one way to explain impulsivity is when you are overly uncertain about if your model of the world is imbued with uncertainty, and you're not capable of predicting the future very well at all, then there is no point to deliberate and make plans. You better act now, because you're just wasting your time and energy. I, I slightly, it's a very simplistic summary of that view. There's a beautiful paper, Bruno Averbeck, who showed that, that across different tasks, you can, uh, that probe impulsivity, you can always explain it as a function of enhanced subjective uncertainty. And we did this here using the HGF and using a virtual slot machine that we programmed and have now been used successfully in a number of groups, both health volunteers and other conditions. And the design, so we measure patients, and these are 37, I believe, patients, uh, prior to surgery with a slot machine. They undergo surgery. There are regular follow-ups over a certain period. And we have another measurement at uh, 13 weeks post-surgery. Now, this slot machine, uh, this is worked by uh, Sai Paliwal, my group, um, is, a, is a fairly realistic gambling scenario where you're in a casino, you can choose different slot machines, you can switch between them at any point in time, you can change your bet size, 
you can make double ups, you can change the casino, etc. We were incredibly proud when we programmed that. We went to a casino and thought, oh gosh, this is, this is the real thing. I don't know whether, whether some of you saw this editorial in Nature a few weeks ago. Do you see that? Science has a gambling problem, it said. And, and what they were trying to say was that in the whole literature on gambling, ever, and I forget the exact number, I think 26, there, there are 26 or so studies that have tested gamblers in a gambling setting. We usually take economic paradigms and very abstract paradigms, and it's just not quite the right context, perhaps. Um, and so we were very proud to have a, a, a realistic slot machine. Now, the gamblers who we measure, they tell us, gosh, this is a bit boring. Can you make it faster? More color, more sound, etc." So anyway, but they do play it. And, and just the behavior. So, so some of these gamblers will, and I'm not joking, you, 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 so they have to make, uh, they have to, uh, make um, um, uh, determine the bet size. They have a fictitious currency. They can earn money. They don't know what it is, but they can make the bets. Some of these press the button several hundred times per trial to crank up their bet size. So you just look at the behavioral data. You don't need statistics. It's just two <coughs> lines that are separated by two orders of magnitude <coughs> for some of the patients. Yeah. It's quite impressive. So anyway, they, they do take it seriously, even though they complain that it's a bit boring. Um, and what we find now is that parameters from the slot machine, uh, from, from, from the HGF, that encode the subject-specific estimate of uncertainty predict treatment, sorry, impulsivity after treatment. And I'm just showing one of the parameters here. This is theta. This is the subjective estimate of what we call metavolatility. And in the paradigm, this means this is, the S, this is what the subject believes is how quickly machines will tend to switch between what they call hot and cold states. So periods when there are a lot of wins and periods when there are lots of losses. And what gamblers do is they would switch machines, which they can do in our paradigms. So, so this, this is a, 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 is a, I forgot the p-values, but this is highly significant. Uh, there is an outlier here. There's an outlier in many ways. When you remove it, it gets a little bit better, but even with it, it's still highly significant. But this is a within sample prediction. What we really would like to do is out of sample prediction, so we did that. So we did a, um, an out-of-sample prediction where we trained the model on all but one of the patients and then tried to predict the last patient. We repeat that for all combinations. And we keep shuffling the prediction vector. And this is the null distribution, and this is the result. This is our result. So it's a highly significant prediction. And again, I didn't put the p-value, but it's large, as you can imagine from, from the histogram. And the cross-validated accuracy of the prediction is a correlation of 0.27. So as you would imagine, as always, the within sample correlation is higher, but it's still not entirely useless. I mean, it's not probably not going to revolutionize the clinical management of DBS, but it's the first prediction that I'm aware of that does this pre-surgery. Right, I think I should better stop um, because we should have time for questions. Um, even though I'm now coming to the most exciting part of my talk. Um, but uh, I will just uh, as gloss over it and should you be interested, you can ask questions in the question time. Uh, and this is really uh, creating a sister field to computational psychiatry, which is computational psychosomatics. And what, what I'll be glossing over now in the next few slides is from these two papers. Um, that um, uh, one of which was published in biological psychiatry, the other one is uh, in Frontiers. Uh, if you're interested in the math, you should read this. If you're interested in the bird's eye view, you should read this. So one thing that as clinicians we are all very familiar with is the idea of homeostasis. Yeah? It's a very fundamental principle in biology that systems have so-called set points and they compare incoming sensor data to those set points and then elicit control commands or control actuators that will impact on the variable that they are trying to control, such as a physiological variable in the body. 
That's just good old homeostatic reactive control. More recently, physiologists have started to talk about allostasis. That is anticipatory control. And there are many examples that you also know where the, body start, where the brain begins to regulate the body prior to any physiological perturbation. So for example, when you sit down at a table and you see food, you start to secrete, well, you, not you, but the, your pancreas starts to secrete insulin way before there is a change in glucose levels. Or you start to produce saliva. Or when you leave a warm room and step out into the cold, you will have anticipatory vasoconstriction way before there's a change in body temperature. Now, I, um, I've become very interested in these things for, uh, because I do think the, 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 the crosstalk between brain and body, particularly in affective disorders, is understudied and, un and, 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 and requires formal concepts. And so everything I've told you about for classical psychiatry, I'm not trying to bring to psychosomatics. And I'm trying to look at control in addition to perception. Because these are closed loops. And now I just want to familiarize with one thought and then I'll, I'll rush to an end. This classical idea of homeostasis can be brought into a Bayesian context if you make the, I think, not entirely uh, implausible assumption that set points are not points, but they are, again, probabilistic representations. They are beliefs about the desirable ranges of bodily variables, the range of variables that the brain believes the body should be in. These are beliefs that can actually be selected by evolution. If you were born with the wrong beliefs about what state your body should be in, you will be selected out. But critically, they can be changed by experience, and we know that some set points change over the life span, and they can be changed very rapidly by predictions. And this provides an elegant vehicle for understanding homeostasis, homeostasis and allostasis, where now homeostatic set points become beliefs, homeostatic beliefs about the expected, uh, about the desirable range of bodily states. You can define now dyshomeostasis formally as information theoretic surprise. You have a measure that tells you what the brain just needs to compute one number that is very easy to compute in order to know how good it is in controlling a bodily variable. And you can define homeostatic control then as actions that depend on precision weighted prediction errors and allostatic control as anticipatory shifts in homeostatic beliefs. And I can assure you this is not fluff. There are, you can derive simple but principled equations that capture these things and they allow you to make formal prediction, to simulate such a system. I won't go through this, I just want to show you one example. This is a fictitious agent who undergoes uh, physiological perturbations and tries to deal with them by having a model of the world and predicting what's going to happen and changing beliefs uh, a priori. Uh, uh, in an anticipatory fashion. But the interesting bit is this one. So what you see here is, is a variable in the body that is, be, is to be controlled. There's a surprise. Every time there's a perturbation, there's a spike of surprise, which decays again. And this is the action signal as you drive your actuators to control the variable. Now, the interesting scenario is this one. This is a situation when the agent, this fictitious agent, predicts that something terrible is going to happen. But, it, but it does not know in which direction. So, th th so it's not an option to change your set point in one direction or another, because it could be fatal. What you can do is you can change the precision of your belief. You can make the expected or desirable range of bodily states very, very narrow. And what that happens is quite remarkable. At this point, five, no perturbation has taken place, and yet, you can see that thing, th there's stuff happening. The variable starts to wriggle around. There is surprise even before anything has happened. And there is action. The brain starts to regulate even though there is nothing to regulate. And why is that? Because the precise belief makes the noise in the sensory channels meaningful. A tiny little deviation that is always there because the systems are noisy suddenly takes on meaning and has to be regulated.
So this is a beautiful metaphor for many psychosomatic conditions where people engage in what has been called, or where they experience allostatic load, yeah? where, they, where they activate chronically sympathetic systems in order to control stuff that doesn't need to be controlled. In fact, when I show this to patients, many of them can relate to this very well. They suddenly have an image. They suddenly have a metaphor of what they experience. The beauty is you can now run individual simulations and let them build their own model of their experience, if you will. And I just want to finish by saying that, that we have taken this work further to theorize about the occurrence of fatigue, uh, which we believe is a metacognitive diagnosis because in, in, in those closed loop systems in cybernetics, there are always layers that monitor the system. And here, you just need to monitor one quantity, the surprise. It's easy to compute in principle. And you can monitor it, and if you see that surprise is not going down despite your best efforts, then that is a diagnosis that you are not in control. You are not in control of your body. That is not a nice state to be in. That is a very threatening experience. If that happens acutely, fatigue would be an adequate response. In other words, stopping doing anything, just waiting for the world to, to go on. Sickness behavior, for example. If that doesn't help, if you experience chronic interrupt of surprise, then that is the expression of learned helplessness in the bodily domain. Maybe that's the point when depression kicks in. So anyway, and we've taken this further. This is work by Rike Petschner, published in Biological Psychiatry recently, where we, we try and bring this all together with psychiatry. And, and basically what we say is, we can bring this all in the same modeling framework, hierarchical Bayesian models. We can model control, we can model predictions or forecasting, we can model interception. We can get those individual estimates of precision weight prediction errors in principle. These models haven't been written down. Well, there are colleagues in the field who have written down models of the sort. We haven't written it down. The challenge will be to make this, again, like the HGF, applicable to real data. And this is where we do the work. This is the TNU at Zurich, a small little house in Zurich. Um, in this building, we assemble modelers, experimentalists, and clinicians, all working in the same labs. On the ground floor, there is a clinic where we can um, welcome patients in a friendly environment. Uh, we have EEGs there. We have behavior labs, uh, physiological labs. Um, MRI is down the road. Um, and, and this is a place where you can do prospective studies in a, in a stable setting over years. Um, if you're interested in the software that, in the, in the tools, here's a bit of software that you can go to. It includes, for example, the HGF. Um, some of you may be interested in training opportunities. We run a yearly annual psychi uh, psychiatry course. Um, uh, this is a whole week course. It attracts uh, 200 students from across the globe. Uh, a international faculty with hands-on uh, uh, modeling exercises. These are the wonderful people I have the privilege to work with at the TNU, a very uh, a, a diverse and skilled team. Uh, there are many friends I'm extremely grateful to for, for, for the wonderful collaboration over many years. And I need to thank my institutions who make all of this possible and, and who come together despite the sibling rivalry. Uh, it's an extremely um, uh, good collaboration. I'm extremely grateful for their joint support. And I'm grateful that I can be here and run so heavily over time. And thank you for enduring me. Thank you. <laughs>